So we're going to be looking together um, at some verses from uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 14. We've been traveling through uh, just some of the stories, some of the interactions that Jesus has with people uh, throughout Scripture, um, with people um, that we might see as potentially outcasts of society. Um, They definitely would have in those days. We've looked uh, at lots of different stories and how Jesus interacts with these people. And we're going to be doing that as well tonight. We're going to be looking in Luke 14. And I'm just going to read um, verses 1 to 14 to us now. Hopefully, oh, yes, Paul, you're a legend. Right, they're on the screen. Follow along, um, and I'm going to read it to us. So it says these words. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honoured in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I'm just going to read that verse again. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, give, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. I love that. <laughs> so as you may or may not know or been able to tell by the slight twang in my voice um, I grew up in the West Midlands um, I grew up in a small town of about 25,000 people called Aldridge uh, there's some people from Aldridge here tonight um, if you haven't heard of Aldridge you might have heard of Warsaw if you haven't heard of Warsaw you might have heard of Birmingham um, uh, so yeah that's where I grew up um, and the funny thing about growing up in Warsaw um, is when I first moved to Sheffield the amount of people that said to me you don't sound very Polish was incredible and every time I had to explain, no, I'm not from Warsaw, I'm from Warsaw. And they'd say, like, you don't sound very Polish. I'm like, I'm not. I'm from the West Midlands. I'm a yam yam. Um, so, yeah, near Birmingham, technically the black country, but we won't get into geopolitics now. Um, but I went to a local church primary school called Coop and Jordan. Um, I had a really, really great time going there. Um, in fact, you might know uh, a Paralympic swimmer by the name of Ellie Simmons. Um, this is about 2008, 2012. Uh, she won a bunch of gold medals um, in the Olympics. She went to my primary school, in fact. Um, and one of my favorite memories of going to Cooper and Jordan was uh, there was this elderly lady who worked on reception. She was called Mrs. Jukes. And she was this lovely, sweet old lady. Um, and she used to do these kind of intercom messages that would go out to um, the, all the classrooms that come through the little telephone speaker. And before she would make the announcement, she'd have this children's xylophone that sat on her windowsill. And she'd play this little tune. She'd go like, ding, 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 or something like that. And then she'd say whatever she had to say. And when Ellie Simmons won these gold medals in 2008 and 2012, Mrs. Jukes played the most amazing thing I've ever heard on this little tiny xylophone. She was like, stuff like this. And then she just so excited said um, that Ellie Simmons had won a gold medal. Anyway, I digress. Um, so yeah, I was at Cooper and Jordan um, Primary School. And uh, as things got to the end of your time being at primary school and you were about to make the transition into year seven, moving on to bigger and brighter things, um, they used to do these award ceremonies where they would hand out trophies, awards um, for specific categories, things like uh, dramatics and theatre or like academics or sports. Anyway, I got nominated for Sportsman of the Year 2009 at Cooper and Jordan. And I can tell from the eyes, I can't see your mouths, but I can tell that you're all very impressed by that. Um, imagine Sports Personality of the Year, but just a little bit more glamorous. And you've got the idea of what it's like. Um, but yeah, five people were nominated alongside me. So it was pretty, it was pretty tough competition. Um, and you see, the reason it was tough competition is because that year, 
my school, my year group, got to the national rounders championship finals for under 11s. Yeah, I can tell you're all impressed by that as well. And I was uh, bowling, I was in the little square in the middle, bowling. Um, so it meant that there was lots of people that were part of that team um, that also got nominated for this uh, coveted piece of silverware. So my teacher was called Mr. Sandy, he was my year six teacher, um, and he and Mr. Hosking, who was the head teacher, they're doing this presentation, there's this speech, there's this whole spiel, this whole facade um, about it being a great team effort. And I'm just sat there thinking, come on, come on, let's get to the final result. Let's find out what's happening. It's like the X Factor final. They're bigging it up. They're bigging it up. We've gone to lockdown. We've gone into, what is it called lockdown? That bit when they're like, it gets all dramatic. Dermot O'Leary goes on a bit of a mad one. Anyway, whatever it was, it felt like that. And I was just thinking, come on, get over it. No one cares. Tell me I've won. We can move on with things. I can get up. I've already prepared my speech. I know what I'm going to say. I've practiced my smiles for the photo, shaking Mr. Hosking's hand. I know how this thing works. So anyway, silence falls across the room. You can tense. It's tense. You can sense the atmosphere in the place. And then Mr. Sandy holds the microphone up to his mouth and he says, so the winner of this year's Sportsman of the Year 2009 is Sam Watson. And I'm like, yes, get in. This is the best moment of my life. This is the pinnacle of my primary school career. I'm 10 years old at this point, so I mean, there's not much to go off. Um, but yeah, I was absolutely elated. And I go to stand up from where I've sat down in this school hall. And then Mr. Sandy picks up the microphone again and carries on speaking. And he says, it is my joy this year to announce that we are actually sharing this award between two people. It's not just Sam, it's also Toby Ballard as well. So I stood there, stood up, about to go up to the front, and then I find out that actually I've got to share this award with someone else. You see, I got it for six months, and he got it for another six months. And they said it was too close to call, so they decided to pick two people, which to me was quite ridiculous. I don't know about you, but it seemed quite ridiculous. All that to say, in that moment, I thought that I was more than I was. I thought I deserved that trophy. I thought I'd earned that trophy. And you know, we've just read in this passage, Jesus calls out the Pharisees about the same thing. He says that those who exalt themselves, like I did, will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I tell you what, I was definitely humbled in that moment. And I'm sure most of us in this room have had moments like that, where we think we're more than we are, where our ego, where our pride gets ahead of us. And if you sat there now thinking, I don't do that, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm very humble, I'm very humble, then that's great, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, and I believe that Jesus has something to say to each of us tonight about this. But I want to think, what's so significant about humility? Why does Jesus even bring it up in this moment, in this context? And why does so much of Scripture talk about God's thoughts on humility? There's a quote that I want to read from uh, a book called Mere Christianity, which was written by C.S. Lewis. Um, it says this, don't imagine that if you meet a really humble person, they will be what most people call humble nowadays. They won't be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who will always be telling you that they are a nobody. Probably, you will think about them. All you will think about them is that they seemed a cheerful, intelligent person who took a real interest in what you said to them. If you do not dislike them, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. They will not be thinking about humility. In fact, they will not be thinking about themselves at all. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell them the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud, and a biggish step too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. Big stuff from C.S. Lewis. It's challenging stuff. They will not be thinking about humility. In fact, they will not be thinking about themselves at all. And we often think of humble people as those who are modest or even self-deprecating, if you like. In my mind, at least, they're the quiet ones, they're the timid ones, they're the ones that aren't necessarily the first to speak up in a situation. That's what I think of when I think of humble people or modest people or whatever that might be. And those of you who know me might know that um, I am quite a laid-back person, despite what my year six antics showed, what I've just shared. Um, and sometimes this part of my personality can give off that impression that actually I, uh, people could see me as humble. People might say, you're very humble or you're quite a humble guy. But actually, it's mainly just part of my personality. I think that that gives that impression because if you're into Myers-Briggs, um, I'm an INTP. Um, I'm a big thinker, big fat thinker. I always have to process things before I actually come out with it and say it. And it just means that often 
I'm quite slow to the situation, slow to bringing something to the forefront of the conversation or to a group situation. And that can be misconstrued as humility because it definitely isn't. Because when someone says to me that you are a humble person, I'm thinking, yes, this is great for me. This is good for me. And it just brings to the surface actually how selfish and how conceited my heart is when it comes to that thing. So as much as anything tonight, I'm speaking to myself. So I'm definitely not humble, as we've established. And the Pharisees at this dinner party where Jesus is aren't either. So who is? Who is humble? Who can stand in that place, that place of humility, and speak into the situation, speak into our lives, speak into our pride? Who has the authority to do that? The humble king, Jesus Christ. Humility is the not-so-secret secret secret to the kingdom of God. Humility is the not-so-secret secret secret to the kingdom of God. If we long to be more, more like Jesus, we must become more and more humble. And one of the best examples in Scripture is where um, Jesus he's, uh, has this interaction between um, himself and two of his disciples, two of his most loyal companions, James and John, and their mother. And basically their mother comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, let my sons sit at your right and your left in your kingdom. And Jesus basically says, like, if you want to follow me, you've got to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm going to drink from. That basically means that if you want to follow me, you have to be willing to die. You have to be willing to give all of yourself in order to follow Jesus. It's a big thing to say for James and John. It's a big claim. But Jesus then, fully God, fully man, even he says, I don't, have, I don't know and I don't have the authority to choose who will sit on my right and the left. Only my father knows that. He reflects it from himself. He deflects it from himself and points to his father. And immediately after this moment where the disciples are bickering among themselves about who's going to be uh, sitting at Jesus' right and the, his left, who's going to be in those positions of authority, Jesus goes on to say these words, which I think really speak to us tonight. He says, Among you it will be different. Whoever wants to lead must serve, and whoever wants to be first must become a slave. And then he finishes by saying, The Son of Man did not come to serve, but instead, sorry, did not come to be served, but instead to serve and to give his life as a ransom of many. So this is the bar that Jesus sets for humility. And thinking that right now, I'm thinking, flip, that's a high bar to reach. And then moments later, he takes it even further because he rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey in the most unexpected, un-king-like fashion. You know, I'd think that he would be, I don't know, the lights would be going, there'd be smoke machines, there'd be like Bon Jovi blasting on the stereo or something like that. He'd want to make an entrance. He'd want to draw the crowd. He'd want to draw some attention. He'd want to make a spectacle, but actually that's not his style and that's not the style of the kingdom of God. He often flies under the radar He often goes from place to place to conversation to conversation without anyone even batting an eye. He's profound in every moment, but so unassuming as well. So we get what Jesus is saying when it comes to humility. We understand that he is the humble king. He's the one that we need to copy, that we need to imitate, that we need to emulate. And if we're honest, we aren't so much. We've got a long, long way to go. And with this passage, I've got a lot of questions. I want to know, what's the significance that Jesus tells the Pharisee all this whilst he's at dinner with them? Why is he doing it in their homes? Why is he doing it in their company, for that matter of fact? Why does he do it on the Sabbath? Why doesn't he do it on another day? Why doesn't he do it the day before or the day after? What's it all got to do with this place at this time? And I just want to think about that really quickly. Firstly, I just love that Jesus is always at parties. (laughs) He's always drinking, he's always eating, he's always hanging out with people. Um, And you can understand why people didn't like him. They called him a drunkard. They called him a glutton. They called him that he hang around with sinners. And I mean, (laughs) that's what he did. That's what he did. He ate. He drank with people. He hung out with people that no one else would even go near. And in this passage from the surface, it looks as if Jesus is just offering some good advice to people. It looks as if he's just offering some kind of dinner party etiquette or some kind of like social convention or something like that. He's trying, it's not as if he's just trying to help his fellow guests avoid any embarrassment in future social situations. And if we think it's just that, then I think we're missing the point. Because Jesus tells us in the scripture that it's a parable. He tells us that it's a, it's a story. And throughout scripture, we see that actually when he says that it's a parable, there's so many layers of meaning to that. He's talking about the ways that the people of his day would jostle for position in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. 
They were so keen to push themselves forward to show how good they were, how pure they were, how righteous they were. They were the kind of people that would frown upon the fact that on the Sabbath, in verse 4, he heals that guy. That's why he's done it. It's to prove a point. It's to make a point. They're so set on rules and regulation. They're so set on law that they're missing the heart and the intent of what God had for them. And Jesus comes in to shake all that up. He heals this guy from whatever's going on with him and sends him out. And the Pharisees were just so obsessed, they were missing what was right in front of them. They were missing the kingdom of God breaking out all around them. Because that's what Jesus did, that's what he brought, he ushered in the kingdom. And the point he's making is this, we pride ourselves on what we can do on our own. In our own strength, in our own ability, in our own power. And we try to push ourselves forward in the sight of God and in the sight of others. When actually we can't do that, we can't earn or prove ourselves before God. We can't bring our trophies, we can't bring our sportsman of the year 2009 to God and say, will you love me more now? Will you do this for me now? Because we can't twist God's arm like that. He just loves us as we are. And that's what it is, it's grace. He loves us as we are, he accepts us as we are. But that doesn't mean that he wants us to stay as we are. And we're going to pray into that in just a moment. Because humility is the key to pleasing God. It's the key of stepping into what it looks like to be like Jesus. It's the key to the kingdom breaking out in our lives. It's the key to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's the key to loving your neighbor as yourself. It's at the crux of everything that we believe. It's at the crux of um, what it is to follow Jesus. It's a fundamental kingdom statement that he's talking about here. Humility is the key. And it's not just about our internal world. It's not just about how we uh, think of ourselves or how we relate to God. It's external as well. It impacts the world around us, the people that we interact with. Because Jesus isn't just correcting some dinner party decorum. He wants to change. He wants to transform us. And this has the potential to transform us and our world. So there's two things that I want us to take away from this, and both are around humility. I think all of us can find ourselves in this story identifying with certain aspects. And I think the Lord has something to say to each of us tonight around that. I think the first is about the idea of being repaid, that when we invite someone or when we welcome someone, or when we interact with someone, we have this mindset of actually, what can this person do for me in return? I think the second is about inviting people in. It's about inviting in those people who we think are so far away from us, but actually God is so, so close to. I just want to share a quick word on each. And as I'm speaking, some of these things might relate to you. Um, and you know, I fall into both camps first and second, so I put my hands up and say, I'm speaking to myself here. I don't need to be disheartened by the challenge. Just hear Jesus' words and hear the invitation. So the first, about being repaid. The Pharisees invited the most distinguished guests to come and eat with them, knowing that they might get an invite in return. They might enter into the inner circle. They might get added to the group chat. They might get invited out to the coolest bar or restaurant that's going on in town. And maybe Jesus' words have pierced your heart about that. Maybe you thought, gosh, that's me. I do that. I treat people differently because of how I think they might repay me or what they can do for me in return. And maybe you're thinking, yes, I change my attitudes towards the people that I interact with. Maybe you have a mindset sometimes that actually these people, someone might be beneath me or I might be superior to them. Maybe a person or a moment has just jumped to the forefront of your mind as I'm saying these things. Maybe God's pressing something on your heart right now. Maybe you're thinking about your work. Maybe there's someone that you put more time and effort into because you think that you can get something back in return. I know I do that. Maybe they're from a different place to you. Maybe they're from a different culture or context. Maybe they speak differently. Maybe they do different things. We need to ask ourselves the question, am I looking to be repaid? Am I looking for favour 
or honor from these people? Am I trying to climb some kind of social ladder or social hierarchy? And if the answer is yes, even a little bit yes, then there's good news, there's grace, because there's no condemnation or guilt in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven. We are forgiven people. But like I said, he doesn't want us to stay in that place. He wants to transform us. He wants to transform our hearts and our minds to be more like him. And there's two parts to that. Firstly, like C.S. Lewis said, we need to accept that we need to be more humble. We need to accept that we are proud. That's the first step to accepting Jesus' forgiveness. It's the first step to accepting his humility. And the second step is to receive that humility. It's to receive Jesus. It's to allow his spirit to renew us, to refresh us, to transform us, to make us more like him. Because we need his spirit to change us. We want to be more like him. We want to love more like him. We want to listen more like him. Because that's what the world needs. And finally, the second thing about invitation, about who do we invite into our lives. And I think if Jesus was here in physical form today, we would find him in the places that we probably wouldn't expect. We'd probably find him in the not-so-nice parts of town, in the places where you don't go there when it's dark, or hanging around with the people where you think, keep your head down, keep going, walk through. We think they're so far away from God. And in truth, they might be. But in truth, people that live in the nice parts or people that drive the fanciest cars, they might be far away from God as well. But actually, it's these people that we need to have our mindsets and our hearts changed that actually God is so, so close to these people. That's what we read in Scripture. That's what we've just read in this passage, that Jesus is hanging around with these people. He's making friends with them. He's inviting them into his personal life. He's investing in them. He wants relationships with them. And I think he calls us to do the same. So maybe you've heard this passage or maybe something that I've shared tonight has just compelled you to act. Maybe it's provoked something within you. Maybe the Lord's just starting to unearth something that's on your heart. So I want to ask the question, who are we welcoming in? Who are we welcoming into our lives? Who are we welcoming into our spaces, our homes, our lunch breaks, our weekends? Is it just the people who look like us? Or just the people that dress like us? Is it just the people that believe the same things that we do? Is it just the people that vote the same way that we do? And we so often go out to reach people, and that's a good thing. We go out onto the streets to where people are at. But the trouble is we so often keep them there. We so often keep people at arm's length. We don't actually invite people in. And I think that's the call that Jesus has on us, on us in this church tonight. Because how amazing would it be to be a church known for welcoming people around for tea? It's so simple. But how amazing would that be? Or inviting someone out for a coffee, or taking someone to a nice restaurant that probably wouldn't usually go there. How amazing would it be to be a church known for that? that there's nothing that these people can offer for us, but we just want to love them like Jesus would. Because here's the deal. We need to be more like Jesus every day. We need to be more humble. We need Jesus to transform us into his likeness. We need him to give us the mind of Christ. To love and serve those who are deemed as outcasts. For those who we might think aren't worthy of our time or our love, or our attention. For those people who don't, we don't agree with, or we don't think we've got anything in common with. But actually, Jesus is calling us into that, because that's what he came to do. And that's what he's called us to do. To seek and save the lost is why he came. And that's our call too. I just want to invite Jesse and Emily to come back out. and I wonder if you'd just stand with me. And we're going to just respond. We're going to spend some time in prayer now. Maybe you just want to close your eyes. If you feel comfortable to, maybe you just want to hold your hands out in front of you. There's nothing special about this. It's just um, 
It's just a physical way of kind of saying, yes, I'm open, yes, I want to receive. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the humble king. Lord, that you never flaunt your authority. Lord, that you never use your position or your power, Lord, to force people or abuse people, Lord. And Jesus, forgive us for when we um, for when we don't see people or treat people in the way that you want us to. Lord, forgive us for when we turn a blind eye to what you're calling us to do. Lord, I pray that right now as we wait, as we receive from you, Lord, that you would just place something on our hearts and on our minds now, Lord. Lord, that you'd help us and you'd call us to step into what it is to live for you and to serve you in this city. Lord, give us eyes and ears to see where you're already at work. Lord, for in those places where we think you're not there, no way would you go there, Lord, but just to see that your spirit is already at work in those places, Lord, and we just get to join in and be involved. So, Lord, move us to action, I pray. Let us not leave this place with just thoughts or just murmurings, Lord, but I pray that it would translate into the way that we live our lives. Lord, to transform this city for your glory, for your fame and your honour. In Sheffield as it is in heaven, we pray. Lord, as we worship you now, we pray that you'd fill us again, Lord, you'd fill us afresh with your spirit, Lord, to leave this place to serve you in every moment, in every second, in every way. Fill us with your power, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.